So, yeah, I'm going to carry on with the with the last part of my with the last part of my talk with the last part of my lectures. And you'll remember that uh, just a little while ago we were talking about axion direct detection. And the goal here is to try and probe the QCD axion. It's very weakly coupled, and all of the constraints we've looked at already that don't rely on the dark matter density cannot reach the, the constraints on the axion mass and coupling expected for the QCD axion if it's dark matter. And I introduced at the end of the last lecture the idea of the axion halo scope and how we might be able to enhance the power and the signal of turning axions into photons by using a resonance. So here's this equation of motion. What I've done is I've taken Maxwell's equations in the presence of an axion source, which couples 3.b, and linearized them. We have the wave equation for the electric field. Now with a source given by derivatives of the axion field. It has to be derivatives of the axion field. If the axion field was constant, the, the term would be a total derivative and wouldn't appear. The axion field is a harmonic oscillator. And, it's, and it, the value of the field is specified by the local dark matter density. So of course, if the axion is not all of the dark matter, the amplitude of this term is smaller. It's proportional to the magnetic field. The magnetic field is parallel to the electric field. It's proportional to the coupling constant. And the oscillation frequency is just given by the, the dispersion relation. It's given by the energy. And, the, and that is dominated by the rest mass energy. But there is a small spread uh, given by the galactic velocity dispersion. And we can have a resonance, for example, if we restrict the electric field to have fixed modes. That's the idea of the radio frequency cavity and the axion dot matter experiment. You restrict the electric field to have a given wavelength and make this natural frequency of your cavity resonant with the axion. And this can be tuned, but not over a very wide range, but it can be tuned. We don't know the axion mass, so we have to try and scan the resonance. That looks like this when you try and make it actually work. So you have a cavity surrounded by some magnetic field. You have some way to tune the frequency of the cavity. You put the whole thing in a big fridge in liquid helium, and then you have some way to measure the outcoming um, signal, the outcoming signal, which is photons produced by the axion in the presence of the magnetic field. There's obviously, this isn't a perfect resonance. There's some damping. In the case of cavity, this is caused by escape of the electric field uh, through the walls. It's not a perfect conductor. So this means that the resonance has some overall quality factor um, and you don't get infinite power out. So for a harmonic oscillator, a, a damped driven resonant harmonic oscillator, this is a very uh, well-known problem to solve. If you simplify it in 1D, you can solve it exactly. And the power of such a such a, such a resonant oscillator is just omega over Q, where Q is the quality factor times energy stored. The quality factor is basically the, the, resonance, um, the resonance frequency divided by the line width. And you can write then the, the, the power for the axion in this kind of nice compact way. It goes like the coupling squared, the volume of the resonator, the applied magnetic field, the dark matter density divided by the axion mass and goes, I think this should be B squared. This should be a B squared. Um, and then this number C, which is the form factor, which is basically how well does your electric field mode that has the right frequency overlap with your magnetic field profile. So that, that, that comes from working up what the modes of your cavity are, which is a boundary value problem. Okay, so, and then they, that's a number of order one for, for, a, for, a, for a desirable mode. And the power, so yeah, B squared, the power in kind of reference values for the axion dark matter experiment is about 10 to the minus 21 to 10 to the minus 22 watts. It's a very low power, so you need very sensitive detectors to try and detect it. This is what ADMX kind of looks like. It's an experiment at um, Washington, University, um, Washington State University in Seattle. And here's like all the ingredients we talked about. There's a cavity that it's going down into a fridge 
This is all the mechanics of a dilution refrigerator to make the cavity very, very cold and to have the readout electronics. And you have a trade off of wanting a large cavity volume versus wanting to cover a dynamic range of resonances. So if the axial mass is about a micro electron volt, the frequency of oscillation is about a gigahertz. So that's why we call these radio frequency cavities. To make the cavity smaller, you lose volume. If you make the cavity bigger, you need to have a much bigger cold space and much higher magnetic field density. So this technology is limited to basically radio frequency gigahertz, but it's very good. And to work out the signal to noise, you use the, the radiometer equation and you can always integrate for longer to beat down your noise power. So your noise is some overall noise temperature, some bandwidth, some integration time. If we knew the axion mass, you could just tune, your tune wherever your resonator is to that frequency and just integrate until you hit the prediction for the QCD axion. But we don't know the mass. So there's always a trade-off in a resonance experiment between the speed of your scanning and how long you spend on each frequency. It's tuning a radio. If you're, in, if you're in your car or you're sat at home and you're tuning a radio, you don't know what station you want to listen to. You keep tuning. But if you tune too quickly, you'll just go through them all and you'll never hear if there's a song on that you like. But if you go too slowly, then you'll never go all the way from 88, from, uh, 88 FM to 104 FM. And you'll never hear whether the frequency station you want is actually there. So it's really just exactly the same game here. These are basically radios. So ADMX, long established, well running experiment. These are the kind of constraints they get in brown. These are slightly old. Reaches the sensitivity to hit the QCD axion band, but pretty narrow, narrow range around a micro electron volt. What's the principle that we've learned here about how to detect axions? The principle is that you need a magnetic field to facilitate axion photon conversion. You need a resonator, in this case, it's a microwave cavity. You need a fridge because you need to make all your noise very small. And you need an amplifier to read out your very weak signal. So this has been pursued by a number of different groups using different types of cavity technology. There is, for example, the, the haystack high frequency cavity um, using, using also quantum techniques for squeezed, um, squeezed states to reduce the noise further. Um, and ADMX have plans for similar kinds of things. You can increase the dynamic range of this by a bit using this. There's also a lot of cavity technology being developed at the Center for Axion Precision Physics in Daejeon in Korea. They have a huge number of different cavity designs that they're looking at to try and extend the range of this idea. But you are fundamentally limited by, by volume. You can't go too big because you can't have very large magnetic fields and you can't go too small because you would have too small volume of, of overall dark matter. So the haloscopes are limited in their dynamic range. And the classic axion searches also, th this, this, this search probes the axion photon coupling. So can we probe other axion couplings and can we extend the dynamic range of our resonances? And new ideas have been really thick and fast on the floor in this field since about 2013. And basically the idea goes for change your microwave, get different resonators, resonators that respond to different couplings and that have different natural frequencies. So one way to do that is this, what's called the dielectric haloscope idea. Um, and it's Mad Max is the acronym. And here you basically use dielectrics to, to change the resonant frequency. What happens is at a dielectric boundary, we have an axion induced electric field on either side of the dielectric boundary in the dielectric and in vacuum the value of the action induced electric field is different in those two regions because, the, because the, the dielectric constant appears in Maxwell's equations. So then because of the dielectric boundary condition is to match the electric field across the boundary. That means that there's a response field that leads to production of photons from the boundary. So here's the idea. Photons are getting produced at each dielectric boundary via the axion. And if you position your dielectrics just right, you can get constructive interference between the photons produced from all of the dielectric boundaries. And this means you can enhance your signal. This is a fabric power ca cavity. 
and you can compute the boost factor for that for that cavity. And this idea allows you to extend the sensitivity of a halo scope up to relatively high frequency, up to about 100 gigahertz. This is an idea that's being developed um, in Germany at the moment. The, the prototypes are kind of being built. Here are some disks of sapphire and some receiver horns trying to characterize how this idea works. Um, and, the, and the proposal is to build, I think, first a prototype at CERN and then the full experiment at DAISY again. Um, this is what the full experiment will look like. There'll be about 80 disks of sapphire, meter squared disks of sapphire, and this absolutely huge magnet. My favorite um, fact about this magnet is it revolved 35 kilometers of superconducting cable. It's an absolutely beast of a machine, and hopefully it will be constructed within the next you know, decade or so. And it has the possibility to scan frequencies up to about 100 or 200 micro EV, which is up to about here, almost 100 gigahertz. So now this is the axion photon coupling and the mass, but normalized such that the KSVZ model is, uh, it's just this dimensionless coupling. So here's KSVZ, here's the FSC, ADMX, and dielectric halo scope Mad Max could go up to almost 100 gigahertz. So pretty promising. Another idea to go to lower frequency is to use electronics. And this is an, and this is an idea called abracadabra. Um, they've now merged with another experiment called dark matter radio, which have a, have a similar, um, similar methodology. Abracadabra uses the fact that the axion in Maxwell's equations looks like an anomalous current density. And then considers this um, current density flowing through a toroid, which will induce a magnetic field inside the tor toroid. And you can measure that. Um, you induce an effective current in the screw, and then you can measure that effect. Sorry, the axion looks like an effective magnetic field in the toroid, which induces an effective current in your um, squid, which is a superconducting quantum interference device, and you can try and detect that. And this, and this idea actually works um, resonant and broadband, and it works broadband at very low frequencies. So, it's, so and because it's broadband, it's, you know, you don't have to scan necessarily. So there's a resonant version where you can scan and achieve high sensitivity, but also a very broadband sensitivity at low frequencies. Abracadabra has been ran as a prototype um, where the toroid is about 12 centimeters. So here are the designs of that idea that has been built at MIT and has taken data. And these are the kind of constraints that they get. So this is a broadband constraint from 10 to the minus nine to 10 to the minus 10 electron volts. It's really an order of magnitude um, covered in frequency. Um, up to a megahertz from 0.1 to 1 megahertz. But the constraints with this prototype on the photon action photon coupling don't yet come outside of the exclusions that we already have from the helioscopes um, from CAST. But this was only a prototype with only one month total integration time. Here are their forecasts for abracadabra going forwards. So there's the 10 centimeter version if they can reduce the noise they can carry on there's then a 75 centimeter version which doesn't quite reach the qcd line and then some ultimate qcd machine um, which could reach the qcd line and so the, here we've got the broadband search and here the resonant search so the broadband search you would detect something but you wouldn't know the axial mass um, but the resonant search is obviously narrow band but with their QCD version, they would first detect it in broadband and then have the possibility to confirm the mass with the resonant version if it sits in the right range of about 10 to minus seven electron volts. So about a megahertz frequency, that's your, that's your circuit resonance frequencies. It's basically an LC circuit resonance. Now, 
next idea I want to tell you, but I'm going to try and get through about two or three more um, ideas in the next 10 minutes. I just want to give you a flavor for the ideas that are going on here. Next idea is the nuclear magnetic resonance halo scope CASPER cosmic axion spin precession ex experiment, which has, um, it, it's actually a whole series of experiments. Some of them are in um, part of the same collaboration. Some of them are in the United States, in Boston, it's Casper Electric and some are being constructed in Germany. The idea now is to match the, use the axion coupling to nucleons, the nuclear spin coupling, make a spin polarized source of nucleons, i.e. NMR, and match the Larmor precession frequency of the nucleon to the axion, to the axion um, spin. Casper Electric uses the dipole moment coupling, so you've just got axion field causing the nuclear dipole moments to oscillate. You apply an electric field and a magnetic field, and then you get the spin precession. Here's your NMR sample. Electric field, magnetic field, axial oscillation induces magnetization in the sample, and you measure that with a squid. Casper Wind does the same thing with the fermion spin current now. Um, and then you have the gradient coupling of the axion. So that means it couples to the axion velocity. So now the same thing, but the axion velocity plays the role of the electric field. And you have the magnetic field. This velocity is in kind of an anomalous, introduces an anomalous precession of the spin, additional magnetization, and you measured that with your squid. The projections for Casper look something like this. Uh, the, the wind coupling can't quite reach the QCD line, um, but has sensitivity at again, very low frequencies. So down to the lowest masses really that the QCD axion can take around 10 to the minus 12 electron volts. Casper Electric um, or would possibly even be able to detect the QCD axion for low masses, but like 10 to the minus 10 electron volts. Casper Electric, Casper Wind both um, have been constructed and have taken um, preliminary data and are currently and are about to start taking their, their main um, their main data so extremely promising. Casper has already taken some data um, with this kind of Zulf zero to ultra low field magnetometry at the University of Mainz in Germany and here's the the Zulf um, constraints they beat the new force constraints this is now on the axial nuclear coupling they beat the new force constraints, uh, which are in blue, but they do not yet get outside the supernova 1987A bounds, although they, they will do in future. And this operates at, it's off at even lower frequencies, down to 10 to the minus 16 electron volts. This is in that black hole radius gap, so very interesting. Uh, these bounds here are from uh, the neutron EDM experiment, and they operate even down to fuzzy dark matter masses. Um, and Casper also can have a, a broadband search down here um, in their future design. Next, next idea is axial electron coupling, only possessed um, at leading order by the DFSC model. So if you can measure this, you can tell whether it's KSVZ or DFSC. And the electron coupling is poorly constrained. Um, and Graham and Rajendran in their 2013 paper didn't have any ideas for um, placing a constraint on it. They just showed some astrophysical constraints from white dwarves and no way to probe the QCD axiom. However, QUACS, uh, which stands for Chiare Axione, it's um, Italian for axion search, um, it uses this idea. It was actually around in the 1980s, um, but has only been uh, constructed recently. Same idea basically as Casper, but using electron spin re resonance in, ferro in, in, um, um, in uh, yttrium ion garnet, YIG. So it's called a ferromagnetic haloscope. This is a picture of their first prototype, which uses a two millimeter sphere of YIG inside a radio frequency cavity. The YIG has magnetization. The radiation field of the magnetization is resonant with the cavity, but the resonant frequency is given by the Larmor frequency of the electrons. So this works at higher frequencies at gigahertz. And then you read it out in a similar way as you do with ADMX. You've got a cavity in your spheres. They've actually now run this with up to, I think, 10 spheres in a row to increase the volume and have plans to go up to 100 um, spheres in new, in new versions. Here's a formula for the power. 
and here are, is, are their constraints. This was the first version, very narrow band, um, doesn't beat the astrophysical constraints, but they've since done better. Um, this is now, so this is the old result there, which is extremely narrow band. They've now got a version at lower frequencies, um, just around 10 gigahertz, um, and improved their sensitivity by almost two orders of magnitude. So you can set the electron coupling. Again, it's just resonance, a lot more resonance on the electron spin. In the last, I think, I think I've probably got about three or four minutes. I want to tell you about my, the idea that I've been working on recently um, to try and extend this resonance idea on the axion photon coupling to the highest frequencies possible. So for masses, milli electron volts, 10 milli electron volts, and frequencies in the low terahertz, 100 gigahertz to one terahertz. And I call this idea too rad um, for topological resonance axion detection. And I'll try and give you a flavor for how it works. The challenge of terahertz detection is we know that we know the dark matter density for the QCD axion, we know the, the coupling and the mass. The experimental parameters are magnetic field, quality factor, effective volume. In terahertz, if you put in an effective volume of terahertz cubed, the power is tiny compared to ADMX, it's 10 to minus 29 watts. And if you wanted to tune a cavity, you'd have to, you'd have to vary the, the length scales on nanometers at sub-Kelvin temperatures very hard. Magnetic resonance, if you can get a magnetic resonance at terahertz, you overcome these problems. The volume is then independent of the frequency, so you can have large volume, and you don't need a mechanical tuning, you only need to tune the magnetic field. So as an NMR magnet, you can do that. Material science then has to come in and say, how can I get this resonator? Antiferromagnetic resonance occurs in, in terahertz, it's basically the, the, the strength of what are called the anisotropy fields in an antiferromagnet, the exchange in anisotropy fields. And in a topological insulator, the antiferromagnetic resonance couples to the electric field and allows the antiferromagnetic resonance to control the resonance of the axion photon coupling, to couple to the resonance of the axion photon coupling. I don't have time to explain why that is, but it occurs in um, what are called dynamical axion um, topological insulators. So, the, so you take a what a new type of quasi particle called an axion, um, called an axion quasi particle, which is, which is quite cute, and you use the resonance of that particle, driven by the dark matter axion, um, to try and detect axions. There are some coupled perturbation equations, which are, uh, we have the electric field coupled to the axion quasi particle theta via the E dot B term. And the key point is that the axion quasi particle theta has um, a mass, a spin wave mass, which is what antiferromagnetic resonance is. This axion quasi particle, it's an antiferromagnetic magnum and it has a terahertz frequency. So now I've just got a coupled system of linear equations. I can diagonalize them and match the resonant frequencies of this, uh, match the eigenfrequency of this system by changing the magnetic field to the driving frequency of the axiom. And this, the, the eigenfrequencies depend on the magnetic field, so it can be tuned. So you can have a resonance when the frequencies match. The concept for this uh, looks like this. You have some crystal of, an, of this special type of material, apply a magnetic field, and then the axion dark matter in the presence of the magnetic field induces these things called axion polaritons inside the crystal. The boundary condition effect that we saw already from MadMax causes then this crystal to emit photons at that resonant frequency, uh, which you can subsequently detect. I ha there is a large paper uh, coming out on this uh, soon with my collaborators where we have some candidate material samples. We can't use them for a dark matter detector yet, um, but we might be able to do some spectroscopy on them and confirm whether they really are the right type of material with the right quasi particles. 
Um, we're interested in the line widths um, in these materials, which are limited by things like magnon scattering. There's a lot of things that could go wrong along the way, but the, but the idea is, is, is getting there. And if it works, if, if we find the right material and then build a big version of it, um, it, it could possibly have sensitivity to the axion in the kind of milli V range, um, almost up at those highest, highest masses allowed from astrophysics. So um, I've told you about an awful lot of different ways to search for dark matter axions today, but they all rely on, well, they almost all rely on resonance um, with the axion frequency. And it's all about scanning the unknown axion frequency. Even if you're broadband, you have to know what range of frequencies is your particular experiment sensitive to. So that is the end of my uh, lecture and I will take some questions. Okay, thank you, David. And I think there is a couple of questions. Uh, there is a couple of questions, one from Koshik. Uh, it says that you talked about couple production mechanism for axion dark matter misalignment decay. How does the estimate changes some bounds relaxes if it happens in a matter dominated background post reheating? Mm -hmm. um, right. Yeah. So the so so the all the estimates I showed for the relic density production indeed assume that there is a radiation dominated background, the oscillation of the axion field occurs during the radiation dominated epoch. Um, so for the string decay case, that has to happen because we've assumed the universe was hot enough to restore the Petri Quinn symmetry um, and, and then have it break again, which happens in a thermal background. But for the scenario B, what I call scenario B, that could indeed happen during the matter dominated epoch and it changes the it, it changes the route density. I don't know exactly um, you know the exact formulae for how, but I think there's a quite good paper on this by Luca Visinelli. Um, so I would look that up. Okay, next question is from Professor Patrick Dasgupta. Uh, the question is there appears to be two peaks observed in the Abra data. What are they do? Uh, what are they due to? Okay, let me go back to this. So I go back to the plot. So we are looking at the right thing. Ah, okay, right. Ah, okay. So these are not um, peaks. So this is the exclu the Abra exclusion. So this is, so this is the, um, the the exclusion curve. What the peaks mean here is it is its frequencies where they don't have as good an exclusion. Um, so so this could be you know some some um, some circuit resonance that they can't get rid of. You should think of this like the noise curves of LIGO for example, and the LIGO noise curves were the exclusions before they had detections. And those noise curves had big peaks in them um, at the, you know, at the, what is it? The resonant frequency of the mains electricity in the United States, for example. Uh, that's just a frequency where you can't get a constraint. So peaks here are not observed peaks, they're, no they're peaks in the noise. Okay, and uh, the last one is from Shubin Noe. When you said in the morning, fuzzy dark matter almost ruled out, you assumed 100% dark matter is made up of that. Yeah. I think Lyman alpha bound will allow fractional fuzzy dark matter easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, right. No, very, very good point. All the bound uh, in the morning, um, I showed all these bounds on, on, on ultralight axions as a function of the, of the fraction. Yeah, so. So, so exactly, Lyman Alpha Forest allows about 10% um, of, of, dark, uh, of dark matter in the kind of 10 to minus 22 EV range. Um, the CMB allows about 2% of dark matter in the very light, uh, in the even lighter ranges. Um, and so, and, and you saw actually the, the, the theoretical prediction um, in that plot, um, it might take me a while to get back to it. Um, let me get back. So you know what I'm talking about. So, da, 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 da. Sorry, I'll, I'll just go back to the plot. God, we did a lot today, didn't we? Okay. Right, okay, yeah. So, indeed, here's the Lyman alpha constraint. 
at about 10%. And below that is allowed. Uh, here's the CMB constraint at a few percent. Below that is allowed. Uh, the, that cost of gradients and Eridanus 2 constraints really eat down. But the theoretical prediction from symmetry breaking at the gut scale is that fuzzy dark matter would make up around 10% of the dark matter. And the lower mass axions would make up around 0.01% of the dark matter. So I actually think that this is a very interesting region to continue exploring with precision cosmology. So this is, you know, if, like some fantasy improved Lyman alpha experiment could eat down into the fuzzy dark matter predictions from the gut scale. Um, future CMB even doesn't, it doesn't hit it, but intensity mapping um, could eat deep into this, um, this kind of prediction. So yeah, the constraints on fuzzy dark matter are always fraction dependent. Um, and I think, there's a, I think there's a good physics case to go for subdominant fractions um, because the subdominant, fra the subdominant fractions correspond to uh, sim spontaneous symmetry breaking at the grand unified scale. So there is uh, one more addendum to this question is that, uh, is there a direct detection probe of a fuzzy dark matter? Um, yeah, I won't go back, back all the way through the slides because it's right at the end, uh, mm. but yes. So there are, uh, so you need to have a very low frequency um, resonance or basically something broadband that works all the way down to the lowest frequency. So fuzzy dark matter frequency is about 10 to the minus seven Hertz, which is about an inverse month. So you need to measure the time dependence of something that depends on the axion field on a scale of like a month. And uh, one, one experiment that did that, 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 that I uh, worked with the experimenters was um, the neutron electric dipole moment experiment. So they measured the neutron electric dipole moment over the course of many, many years. And we looked in that data for a slow time variation and we didn't find one, but we could translate it into a constraint on a fuzzy dark matter coupling to the neutron EDM. Now you don't expect there to be one of those, but you can constrain it. Uh, there's another way uh, for axions. So Casper uh, Zulf, the zero to ultra low field version, their sensitivity extends down to very low frequencies. They can get constraints on the fuzzy dark matter coupling to uh, the, nucle the nuclear spin currents. And then if you abandon the idea that fuzzy dark matter is an axion and that's have scalar couplings, then there are strong constraints on, um, uh, on the mass, on the frequency scale corresponding to 10 to the minus 22 EV coming from atomic spectroscopy. And um, so if you have a scalar coupling that correspond, that can kind of correspond to basically shifts in alpha um, on the scale of um, you know, 10 to the minus seven Hertz and splittings, micro splittings of atomic energy levels and um, they actually have their, their peak sensitivity around 10 to the minus 22 EV. Um, but that's not a coupling that's allowed for an axion like fuzzy dark matter component. Okay, then thanks, David, for this talk and for your answering the questions. I think the, we should end the session here. And uh, I don't find Suginoy, are you here? Um, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, so there, clap yeah. for David for giving four yeah. lectures. Yeah. On... Uh, both uh, thank Vivian and David for the nice lectures. And I, 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 I like to mention there are a couple of or three questions for the for Vivian. I think Subina, you will pass them on to the. Yeah. Speaker. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the session ends here after thanking Vivian and David and Subina, of course. I mean, this is a nice. Uh, this is nice to be here, actually. Thanks. Everyone is unmuted, so they can uh, okay. see you they can unmute themselves and clap for our speakers for today. Thank you. Thank you, David.